Hi, everyone. My name is Larry Rosen, and I'm president of Edison Research. We are a survey research and polling company based in New Jersey. Among our many areas of inquiry, we've been privileged to be the company chosen by the NEP, the National Election Pool, which consists of ABC News, CBS News, CNN, and NBC News, to provide election polls, entrance and exit polls in the case of the primaries, since the 2004 presidential election cycle. So today I'm going to walk you through some of the findings that we thought were interesting as they pertain to what might happen in November. We will not have a live Q&A session after the presentation, but if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the Q&A or chat feature on this Zoom meeting. Our team is standing by and we'll do our best to answer those questions during the presentation or, or soon after it's over. You can also email us at info at edisonresearch.com, as you see there on the screen, if you have questions or need or desire some more information. Over the course of the primary season, Edison Research performed 23 entrance and exit polls. These are how these television networks and other news organizations analyze who voted, how they voted, what motivated them to vote, etc. Starting with the Iowa caucus on February 3rd, and then the New Hampshire primary on February 11th, then moving on to Nevada and South Carolina, then the huge roster of states on Super Tuesday, March 3rd, including the large states of California and Texas. And then we did polling in another seven states combined on March 10th and March 17th. In total, we completed 37,000 interviews so we have a huge number of voters that we talk to, and we're able to combine the data from each state, appropriately weighting the state to its size within the total primary vote. So we really have the finest possible way of looking at verified voters in these Democratic primaries that's available to anybody. So as I said, with Joe Biden now the presumptive nominee, and with no more exit polls to be conducted until the fall, we at Edison thought it would be a good time to go through all the data we collected from all the primaries and caucuses. We are putting an eye towards what we can learn about the Democratic primary voters and how the trends we can find from pulling all their data together might allow us to look forward into November. Now, let me also mention what this presentation is not designed to be. I'm not planning on explaining yet again why Biden won or why any of the other candidates lost. There are lots of other really insightful analyses on these questions, many of which came from our partners at the National Election Pool. If you go to the websites of any of them, uh, to their politics pages or go through their social media accounts, you'll see lots of great analyses where they're using our exit poll data to explain the outcome. Again, why Biden won. What I want to do instead is to look at who voted, how they voted, and what indications we might see from this that could help us look at November. So as I said, Joe Biden is going to be the candidate of the Democratic Party. So one of the first things we can look at is which groups supported him more, which less, and what that might mean for November. So this page shows the total vote in the 23 primaries and caucuses we performed. Now, some of you may be surprised to see that Biden had won only 40% of the vote through the March 17th primaries. And the only primary that's happened since then was the recent primary in Wisconsin. But the nature of the primary system, the way it's sort of set up with, if you recall, there's the 15% threshold for getting delegates. It means that few delegates were being won by anyone other than Biden and Sanders, and that four to three ratio of votes that you see here is pretty much it connects back to the delegate ratio between Biden and Sanders. Right off the bat, you see that looking at the entire Democratic primary electorate gives us a little different view than we're used to seeing or might expect. Biden, while clearly the leader, did not even get half of the votes cast uh, to date. But we can also look at the vote within subgroups to get a sense for where Biden ran stronger or weaker. And that might create some indications towards how he might do in the fall. In particular, we need to look at the areas where Biden ran weaker, the key groups that he will need to win over more strongly to consolidate a sufficient coalition to lead to victory. Let's start by looking at the vote among men versus that among women. Here's how to read these graphs. 
on the right side where the legend is, you see the size of each group. So in this case, 57% of the voters in all the Democratic primaries combined were women and 43% were men. And while the story is not overwhelming, we do see on the left there that Biden garnered slightly higher support among that larger group of women than he did among men. Now, the general electorate in the fall will not be as tilted to women as this primary electorate is. But winning strongly, essentially running up the score among women, will be crucial to Biden's chances. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won women by 13 points, while Trump won men by 11. So showing a greater advantage among women, as he did in the primaries, should really push in Biden's favor. The far bigger story emerges when we look at age groups. Focus in on the pink and dark blue bars, which represent the youngest voters in our survey. While they make up a smaller portion of all the voters, Biden vastly underperformed among younger voters. Now, Clinton easily won among younger voters, that is, voters under 45 years old in 2016. And it's likely that Biden will win these groups in the general election as well. The whole key for Biden will be motivating large numbers of them to come out and vote in the first place or to vote, depending on how it's done in the first place. With regard to younger voters, Biden clearly has his work cut out for him. He's also vulnerable if a third party candidate can run in the far left slot and peel away numbers, which is some of what we saw in 2016. Even Jill Stein's very small numbers did make a difference in certain close states. Another key aspect of winning a coalition for a winning Democratic candidate in a general election is, of course, to get an enormous portion of the black and Hispanic votes. And as has been so well reported, Biden can chalk up his primary turnaround to African-American support, first in South Carolina and then in other states. And as this graph shows, Biden won this vote by an overwhelming margin. But it's clear as well that Biden has work to do with the Latino community. Now, a lot of this is the same function as what I showed on the previous previous page, which is a function of age and how young the Hispanic population is. Um, It's the same issue as, as I just talked about. Most Hispanic voters are younger and younger voters did not support Biden. But no Democratic candidate can win without overwhelming turnout and support from people of color. Biden, of course, has the advantage of his association with President Obama, but by the same token, so did Hillary Clinton four years ago. So when the analysis of the results in November is done, how much Biden could rack up the score among black and Hispanic voters and how many came out to vote will be a key indicator. It is widely reported that the rapid consolidation of the party around Biden was a victory for the quote-unquote establishment. And this graph begins to show that story and also show another possible challenge for Biden. As can be seen here, Biden won handily among the large majority of voters who consider themselves Democrats. However, he lost to Sanders among those who consider themselves independents. This is possibly one example where the normal sort of left-right spectrum of American politics sort of, it kind of bends around a little bit. Yes, clearly there is one axis of politics, conservative to liberal, but there's also this pro and anti-Washington strain, or you could consider it a pro and anti-establishment strain that actually connects certain Sanders supporters to certain Trump supporters. And that could be a challenge to Biden in the fall. Biden, of course, is about as establishment as a politician could possibly be, as inside Washington as one could get. So think of this group as sort of that Joe Rogan strain within the Sanders support. People who just don't want any candidate associated with the establishment and may drift back to Trump. And that will be one of the subgroups that Biden really needs to look at and make sure he speaks to in, in a compelling manner. But now we can also look at a dynamic that bends in Biden's favor. Clinton won strongly among the college educated four years ago, while narrowly losing those with less educational attainment. Meanwhile, as you can see here, Biden performed better among those who had less educational attainment. This could be an indication that despite his Washington insider factor, Biden has a bit of a more regular folks persona, at least as compared to 
Hillary Clinton, and perhaps he will play better with this group. And then lastly, we can look at the data by political philosophy. As you can see, the overwhelming majority of these voters, voters in the Democratic primary, say they are liberal, with a quarter saying they are very liberal. Unsurprisingly, Sanders dominated that very liberal quarter. Biden's overwhelming support among moderate Democrats would seem to bode well as he navigates into the fall, trying to be liberal enough to motivate the Sanders supporters to come out and vote in, especially in the highly contested states, while making sure he is appropriately appealing to those closer to the middle. And while we're on this topic, there is an interesting point to be found here. While many of the policies discussed by the candidates in the primary season for the Democrats, those policies are perceived as being more left-wing or liberal than we saw previously. The Democratic Party electorate proved not really to be so. Here is the data from that previous page, the 2020 data. And here is that same graph from the 2016 primaries. Now, there are cross currents involved here. There were different states in, in the two different uh, data sets. There were no competitive Republican primaries this time, but there were four years ago. But still, you can see in total, the two electorates were exactly the same on this question. How they placed themselves along the spectrum didn't change at all. It's the discussion that seems to have changed, not how people categorize themselves. And this comes to light when we look at the issue, for instance, of he healthcare, which is sure to be one of the key issues in the fall, especially with everything that's going on now. We asked voters, how do you feel about replacing all private health insurance with a single government plan for everyone? As you can see, a clear majority of Democrats or those who voted in these primaries support not just expanded Obamacare, but abolishing private plans. To date, Biden has not supported this more expansive option. And at least before this current moment, this pandemic moment, a single payer option was not popular nationally. But this shows that single payer is now a mainstream liberal idea. Again, that people didn't say they're more liberal. What's considered mainstream liberal versus very liberal seems to have changed over, for instance, the last four years. This graph shows that same question among supporters of each candidate. The Biden voters, as you can see, narrowly oppose a single-payer option, as did the Bloomberg voters. Sanders and Warren's voters overwhelmingly support a single-payer option, or a single-payer policy, that is. And again, the, the self-described liberalness of the Democratic Party doesn't seem to have changed, but at least this policy is no longer seen as being quite so on the fringe, quite so liberal. So then we now get to what is the single most potent uniting factor within the Democratic electorate, their rage with the current president and their level of motivation to see him defeated. First, as it was pretty widely covered, a majority of Democrats told us that winning mattered to them more than finding a candidate aligned with their issue positions. By nearly two to one, Democratic primary voters said that winning mattered most. They'll take anyone who can win over someone who's perfectly aligned with what they think. But things became even clearer with this question. Which comes closest to your feelings about the Trump administration? The four options were enthusiastic, satisfied but not enthusiastic, dissatisfied but not angry, or angry. And as you can see, more than two-thirds said they are angry. And almost no one gave either of the first two choices, satisfied or enthusiastic. There is an ardor to the feelings about Trump that seemingly could have the power to lift any candidate to victory in the fall. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look at who is so angry. So on this graph, you see there's only small differences between men and women, with women a little more likely to choose this extreme option. Unsurprisingly, or at least I would think, the more liberal one characterizes oneself, the more likely one is to say they are angry. But even a majority of moderate Democrats say they are angry at the Trump administration. And bear in mind, almost anyone who didn't say angry said they were dissatisfied. This graph is just a measure of the most extreme answer and who gave it. The level of anger correlated to the level of educational attainment. The higher the attainment, the more the anger. 
This one provides a little more color, I thought, as those farther down the attainment scale were more likely to say that they were just dissatisfied as opposed to truly angry. So Biden has that challenge of finding the right level of modulation between the fully angry and the merely dissatisfied, and then the people who are more on the fence about Trump, who wouldn't probably vote in the Democratic primary, uh, but perhaps are the very people who could swing an election over to Biden. So finding that perfect tone, speaking to those who are angry and want to get rid of Trump at all costs, but also speaking in a convincing manner to those who are merely dissatisfied or just questioning Trump will be a key challenge uh, for Biden as he tries to walk that line. And the majority of supporters to each of the main vote getters say they are angry. So you can see for all the candidates here, uh, but I think there's something to keep an eye on for that Warren supporter number down there at the bottom of the page. Yes, her level of support was relatively small, but her voters are the angriest, or at least the most likely to say they are angry. Now, Biden has already said that he will choose a woman as his vice president. And Biden's choice of vice president is probably the most significant VP choice since Henry Wallace was replaced by Harry Truman in 1944. Given Biden's age, just from a pure actuarial standpoint, this vice president will have a significant chance to succeed Biden if he wins, either through constitutional succession or election in 2024. So this is a big decision for Biden. And Lord knows if Biden were to change his mind on this announcement regarding a woman, not that there's been any such indication, but were that to happen, uh, I think we could at least agree that that would be interesting to see how that would play out among Democratic women, especially uh, on the liberal end of the Democratic Party. So now we know who voted and who voted for whom and just how angry the Democratic primary voters are about Trump. But we also know that if people don't turn out in November or whatever the equivalent of turnout will be, uh, depending on how the vote is actually conducted in this pandemic world, if people don't turn out or vote and people like them don't turn out and vote, the Democratic candidate will lose because we live in an era of close elections and at least as of here in April, there's every indication that this year's election will be close as well. So luckily, we asked some questions about likelihood to vote. On this graph, we are looking to the answer for this November, will you vote for the Democratic nom nominee regardless of who it is? And on this graph, we're only looking at those who did not vote for Biden. We can safely assume that those who did will vote for him in the fall. And 85% of people who voted for someone other than Joe Biden in the primaries said that they will support whoever the nominee is, no matter what. As I previously said, Democrats just want to win. And on this page, we look at the same question among those who supported each alternative candidate. Huge numbers in every case, with the exception of the tiny number of Tulsi Gabbard voters, said that they will support the candidate, whoever it might be. But the most significant number, of course, is up on top. The big number of votes that didn't go to Biden went to Sanders. And even among those who voted for Sanders, among whom there is a very loud and vociferous group that believes in Bernie all the way, even five of six of them said that they will vote for whoever wins in the primaries. On top of which, we have to remember that the electorate changes in each presidential cycle. Four years pass. People move from state to state. The people who voted in 2016 will not be all the people who vote in 2020. And fully 12% of the people in the Democratic primary said that they were voting in a primary or caucus for the first time. And this will be a key metric to look at in the fall. The changes in the electorate. People who are new to the voting process or who didn't vote four years ago or who weren't old enough to vote four years ago. How big a portion of the total vote are they? Who did they vote for? And how much might it change things in the key states that decide our current elections? So we have strong evidence that Democrats are motivated to win. And through a series of twists and turns and surprises, they ended up with Joe Biden as their candidate. And yes, when asked in theory, as I just showed, almost all Democrats said they will vote for whoever has a D next to their name. But 
it's not a generic candidate who's voting. It is former longtime senator, former eight-year vice president, 77-year-old Joe Biden. What do they think of their choice and what might that tell us about how he might do in the general election? As the primaries went on and candidates fell away from the field, there was an increasing belief that Biden had the best chance to defeat Trump. We asked this question, and here we look at it over time. By the most recent exit poll, 69% of respondents said that Biden had the best chance to win. And believing someone can win is the first step in winning. And it really is a story for the books. And I mentioned previously how there's so many great analyses of how quickly the establishment elements of the Democratic Party coalesced around Biden once they thought that he had the best chance to win. And in seven primaries, we asked the classic favorable, unfavorable question. As you can see here, among Democratic primary voters asked about Joe Biden, there is strong but not unanimous favorable opinions. 70% of those we asked had a favorable impression of Joe Biden, which is, again, good but not great for party members talking about who, the man who would eventually be the candidate representing their party. And the problem that really presents itself is when we look at those who voted for Bernie Sanders. More than half of Sanders voters said that they have a negative opinion of Joe Biden, an, an unfavorable opinion. The other side of that same coin is younger voters, as you can see on this graph. It's the same people who largely voted for Sanders. They are really rather lukewarm about Joe Biden. This favorable, unfavorable issue often becomes one of the most telling issues in any presidential race. As we can see here, for instance, Biden has positive but not fantastic favorables among the independents who voted in these primaries. And this will be a real factor to watch in polling leading up to the November vote. Last time in 2016, Hillary Clinton had the second worst favor favorability level of any candidate ever measured in exit polls. Who was the only one to ever get an even worse number? Well, it was her opponent, Donald Trump. We had kind of an amazing election where both candidates went in with negative favorables, as they're called, um, and people sort of had to choose between two candidates that they didn't like. In fact, 18% of people who voted in, in 2016 said they didn't like either of these candidates. And it was that group, the group that like neither candidate, who broke hard to Trump and provided him with his margin of victory in five key states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Florida. So a key thing to look at in the run-up to the election is this favorable, unfavorable score for Biden. Can he maintain decent favorables against what will surely be a massive blitz of negative ads that's going to be coming his way? And then in November, how will what will likely, again, be a large group of people who don't like either candidate, how will they break? That will likely be the key to the whole election, especially in those close states. So watching those favorables will be an absolute key. So just running through some of the main points of this presentation, the uniting force within the Democratic primary electorate is anger with Donald Trump, getting rid of Donald Trump. Like most presidential elections with an incumbent on the ballot, the race really will be more about Trump, frankly, than it will be about Biden. It's going to be a referendum on the incumbent, as this kind of election typically is. In general, the Democrats are largely unified around Biden, saying they will vote for the Dem Democrat no matter who he is, giving him decent but not spectacular scores. But Biden will need to really work to drive turnout among those traditionally Democratic groups and work extremely hard to win over the younger and more anti-establishment elements of the electorate who have shown much less passion and excitement about Biden. And then finally, he's going to really need to work hard to protect his favorable scores against what will surely be an absolute onslaught uh, many, many hundreds of millions of dollars of negative advertising that will be coming his way. Of course, there's plenty of other variables that could change things between now and November. And the easiest prediction of all 
is that as there were in these primaries, there will be surprises, twists and turns along the way that no one could have predicted. We will have one major candidate running to be the oldest person ever elected president. Ronald Reagan was 73 in the 1984 election, and Donald Trump will turn 74 this summer, running against another candidate who is about four years yet older. Biden was already on this mortal coil when the story I told from before, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt was in his third term and Democrats made Harry Truman uh, their vice president in 1944. Trump arrived here on earth soon thereafter during the Truman administration. Who knows how much either or each of their ages may play into the outcome. We also have really not had a significant chance yet to see how the biggest story in America in at least 20 years, the COVID-19 pandemic, will play into presidential politics. Will either convention even happen or will they just be virtual? Will either candidate, remember, both septuagenarians, even venture outside his house between now and November? And how might a fully virtual campaign change the outcome? And finally, how will each state vote? Technically, how will the mechanisms of voting possibly change? How will people cast their votes in November? That remains a huge open question that no one really currently knows the answer to and how that may scramble things further. So we're happy to hear from you to discuss these or any topics. You can contact us using the information on the screen right now. And with that, uh, I hope this presentation provided you with a new look at how the primaries will lead to November. And uh, I ask you all to keep safe and healthy. And thank you for participating in this webinar and uh, the honor of your time.